So that being said, I'll uh, get it going here. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background on me. Uh, so I teach in North Carolina. I actually teach right outside of Elizabeth City, uh, a little tiny rural school called Camden. It's the first uh, public school that I started working at. Before that, I actually worked in a detention center for a little while doing uh, art therapy for high school age kids. Um, and I absolutely love that job, but that paid worse than public school, so you can imagine it's pretty low. Um, that all being said, it was a really good job and it really kind of got me uh, into education. Before that, uh, I was a graphic designer, I was an animator. Uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I uh, grew up there downtown, and then I actually moved out to LA after going to uh, college for animation, uh, traditional hand drawn Disney style. Um, lived in LA, did some freelance and stuff from there, and then eventually moved back to uh, Pittsburgh, where I started working for the Art Institute of Pittsburgh Online Division. Um, personal opinions and stuff aside, uh, it was not the greatest job in the universe. Um, the, the programs seem fine, I can't talk bad about them, but I just didn't like the job. Um, but I got to talk to high school students every day of my life. Uh, I learned very, very quickly that there were a lot more students out there with a lot of passion, but unfortunately not a great amount of skill to show. I, I was kind of like, I was the wall uh, for their portfolio review. Uh, and I was disappointed. Uh, they, the kids that were applying weren't that good, uh, just, just fundamentally weren't that good. But I would talk to them on the phone and they obviously wanted it, uh, but something had led them astray. So, Long and short, I didn't like the job I was at, but I liked working with this kind of community, and that's kind of what led me into uh, education. So I went back to school, and I've since gone back to school again. I'm, I'm a semester away from my MFA. Oh my god! Um, but but um, that kind of led me into education, and really since then, uh, I've absolutely fallen in love with education. Um, down the road, I'd like to kind of migrate uh, just to see different areas, uh, whether it be in the Virginia area or the college uh, arena. Um, but just to kind of expand my own personal horizon. But definitely teaching uh, has really kind of captivated uh, my brain. Again, keep in mind, my background originally not only was in the arts, but in animation. So I'm kind of like perpetually on like 11. Uh, I just, I'm very animated. Um, and I think you kind of have to be a little bit. Um, you'll find kind of throughout this kind of talk, but just in general, my own personal motif. Um, if any of you guys have ever heard of uh, Dale Carnegie, he's a, a kind of motivational dude. Um, his big, er, big kind of idea is you have to act enthusiastic to be enthusiastic. And the basic premise of that, how I've always personally interpreted, is if you're having a crummy day, because we do, uh, if you're having a crummy day and you come in and you simply fake it till you make it a little bit, you know, first period comes in and you just charge yourself up, wield yourself from inside to put it onto 11, pretty soon those kids, their own happiness kind of mirrored in yourself, kind of juices you back up. So if I act, enthusiastic, eventually it'll kind of come back to me again. So a lot of that really kind of permeates through just my general teaching and ge uh, just kind of overall. That being said, when I did start uh, teaching, like I said I didn't come from the academic world. In fact, I was a god-awful student throughout most of my, my school years, um, D minus, C plus on a good day. Like I was not a good kid. I personally feel that that has helped me immensely being a teacher because I totally get the C minus kid. I was the C minus kid. Um, so I absolutely really can relate to those kids. But when I got into teaching, I found very quickly, and I, I apologize ahead of time, I don't know any of you, so maybe I'm gonna step on toes. But I found out very, very quickly that most teachers were the ones who did really well in school and probably played teacher as a kid in elementary school and just kind of followed that general path throughout their whole lives. I found very quickly that I was in the minority as far as like I went out, did some stuff, and now I'm coming back and kind of reevaluating my own personal education and how I can give that to my students. In turn, I found a lot of teachers very much because they liked education already, um, the idea of a reward system, whether it be a gold star or otherwise, uh, the idea of a re reward system worked really well for them because they liked the rewards before. It was easy for them to kind of translate that. But for those C minus kids and below, it did nothing. Uh, when I was in school, even in elementary school, I could give two hoots about your sticker. Um, and especially as I got older, I can go buy my own damn stickers. I don't need your stickers, you know what I mean? And the thing is too, I, I try to teach that to my students, whether it be uh, a sticker or any kind of reward system, eventually it kind of runs its course. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, especially whenever it, eventually it shifts away from a reward and into punishment. Um, because when you don't have a reward that works, you kind of switch to the other hand. I um, mean, I can really quickly leave straight, i.e. why I'm so bad at math today, because um, that shift happens all the time. Um, so again, I apologize about flipping back and forth here, but let's kind of move forward. So, 
Uh, I'm going to refer to a couple different TED Talks and different uh, references in general throughout the talk here. And it won't be too long. I'll go pretty quickly. Um, but this here is uh, Adam Lipsake, and uh, in one of his talks, he uh, kind of began, so I'm going to kind of paraphrase from him, but he kind of started out and he asked his audience these questions. And so for a second, I just want you to rhetorically kind of think to yourself, who are you? What do you do? Just what do you do? However you interpret that. Um, who do you work for? What the work you do and who you for? And then finally, how does that work that you do help those people that you work for change themselves for the better? So kind of get that in your head a little bit real quick. Who are you? And again, maybe you're thinking about your personal name. What's your personal identity? Are you an art teacher? Are you Mr. Kozak? Are you that guy who drove two hours to go to a different states conference that you totally snuck into their Facebook club? That's fine too. <laughs> Whoever you are, right? Whoever you are. Think about what do you do? Again, are you an art teacher? Are you a specific kind of art teacher? Are you a middle school teacher that happens to teach art? There's different ways you can kind of organize this, right? So I was watching through his presentation, I really wanted to kind of steal from him. And again, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but he did a whole different take on it. Um, but what I really found inspiring from his uh, standpoint here was <laughs> that there's only one question that really matters. Because these first three here all deal with you. They all deal with you in personally. And yet this one here, this last one, is the only one that looks externally. It's the only one that goes outwards and says, okay, well, your role whether it's your job or your name or whatever identity you have, changes over many, many, many generations throughout your life. We constantly are changing who we are. So these questions don't really matter. Who you work for also changes. Maybe you find yourself that you work for the students in hell to the administration, or you work for a district and really your students come and go. Again, all of that can change. That can change here and now. You could have come into this room, by the time you leave, you might think completely differently, but, but the work that you do can directly affect how you perform, right? Because that's the goal here. Whether you're a teacher that works with different age groups, whether you're elementary, middle school, or high school, the goal of teaching is to answer that last question, right? Because I don't care if you're the best drawler, you're the best painter, it doesn't matter what your craft is. It matters, are you reaching the kids? I feel like the, the Stand and Deliver movie, remember that one? Like, I gotta reach the kids. So um, that's, that's really the goal here, right? Is that we're trying to reach our demographics. So there's a, uh, I'm really big into philosophy. I find that philosophy oftentimes bleeds its way into my class. Uh, I would love to be a philosophy teacher that just happens to draw occasionally. Um, but one uh, philosopher here, his name is Sartre. Um, never mind, okay. So um, we've got Sartre here, he's a, he's a classy looking gent. Um, and he wrote this uh, very easily digestible book called Existentialism is a Humanism. Uh, that's a light read, you could read it on your ride down to, uh, to wherever you're coming from here. Um, but his big takeaway from this entire book here was existence precedes essence, right? So the idea basically is that you have, again, I don't like to read off the slides, but just for the sake of example here, um, you have the fact that you yourself already exist, right? You came into this universe, but you came in with nothing, right? We have no preconceived notion you are the choices that you make. Again, kind of a, a you know, cause and effect situation. So we are constantly remaking ourselves based on our choices, but think about all the minute little choices you have. You had a choice to go to four different rooms, and for whatever god awful reason you decided to come to mine, <laughs> where they spelled my name wrong on the outside, but that was okay, because you don't even know me yet. I could have taken a Sharpie and changed that, but I chose not to, out of respect for whoever made that sign. Um, we, we are constantly making these little tiny choices, and they slowly are shifting and moving who we are. Now, the different kind of uh, twist on that that he brings up is once your choices start to begin to make you, we start to fear, right? And we start to worry and, and kind of self-doubt ourselves a little bit. We start to play that role, right? How many times are you, when you're sitting in front of your classroom, how many times are you putting on that face, right? And it's not a bad thing, right? In fact, it's a good thing because the person I am in my classroom, like for example, I would never invite my wife to come to my classroom. She sees me. I don't want her to see Mr. Kozak. They are two <laughs> completely different entities, you know what I mean? Um, but they are roles that we play. The problem comes, and as Sartre talks about, the problem comes whenever these two roles either merge and or switch places. There's nothing wrong with having a role to play. The problem is whenever the role starts playing you, right? Whenever you start being that person 24-7, right? 
right? That, oh, an art teacher doesn't do this, so I won't do this, right? An art student is really bad at math. Ergo, there's no way I could be good at math. I'll never try again, right? We fit the role that we are. And again, I do it too, right? There are a lot of times where I'll joke with my students, be like, oh, you're just a bunch of art kids, you're fine, right? And they fit that niche, right? But again, how many times we allow that to happen, and as long as we're aware of that happening, we can start to counter correct it a little bit. We can start to kind of find who we are versus what our role is. All right, so I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with Sir Ken Robinson. He's a classy gent. Um, and he's talked many times, he's had a million and one TED Talks, and he's wrote uh, like a thousand different articles that if you haven't read them, you should read every single one of them. Every word of this guy speaks is gospel. Um, but, but, we'll kind of start at the bottom here, right? We all know there are problems in education, right? Remember, at the same time, too, it's, again, kind of playing that role. It's easy to be the American educator, where every other culture has us trumped, right? We're told all the time, every single time you guys have a, a meeting in school or whatever it may be, you're told that Finland has got our math numbers beat. <laughs> First off, screw Finland, they're not here, right? But on top of that, every single culture ever is reforming. They're in the process of reforming their education. Some have found things that work, but not everything that works. It's not like magically Finland just figured it out and they're just keeping it a secret and they don't want us to know, right? They're finding what works for them. We're in the same process. We're all in the same boat because the big problem is where our education comes from. And again, a lot of this stuff you guys already know, so I don't mean to rehash uh, old, old territory. But the basic idea of the education that we are learning today, or at least that we're teaching to our students, is really perpetuating the, the 1950s kind of mantra of the Industrial Revolution, right? The bell rings, you come into a classroom, no matter whether you're done or not, whether you get the concept or not, when that bell rings, we have lobiumly leave the classroom, right? That's a factory. The bell rings, go to lunch, okay, come back, good, hit this button a couple times, right? We're, we're, it's built like a factory. The problem is we don't teach our students to work in a factory anymore. It's not that they can't, but there's just not that many factories anymore, right? So that's why we're reforming it. It's not that necessarily the system is broken, just the system doesn't fit anymore. It's like taking out that sweater from last Christmas. The sweater's still fine, I'm still fine, but the sweater no longer fits me. That turtleneck is way too tight, right? Okay. So that kind of moves forward. And again, this simple idea of, of kind of our American lifestyle, right? Capitalism, yay, and there's nothing wrong with that. But most of that comes from kind of two direct sources historically. A lot of our ideas and our work ethics that we as Americans have come from early uh, Calvinists, the religion-based idea, which links into Immanuel Kant's idea of bentology, um, the idea of your moral wealth is based upon your deeds, your actions. Now again, maybe you believe that, maybe you don't, but I'm simply just kind of stating the fact that we are perpetuating and building up the idea that you do good, you get a good job, the end, right? The problem that you run into is that a lot of times nowadays that's just not true. It wasn't really, it hasn't been true for a couple of years, we've just kind of lied to ourselves. Um, the problem big time right now is that our students aren't buying it anymore. They're in on the joke. Whereas before, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we knew it was coming, it was a tidal wave, we could see it on the horizon. At this point, they know. They know it's not worth it, right? How many people, you know, they, they see on news all the time, you know, Steve Jobs, whoever they want to idolize is kind of the big dude that they want to follow along. You know, these guys profess the fact that I didn't go to college, or if I did, I went to a year and I dropped out. It's not that important, right? So their idols are saying, don't bother, it's not worth it, right? Then we come in and we, you know, dauntingly give them facts on a board, we read off of a PowerPoint presentation and say, and now you should go to school to be like me, because I eat lots of ramen and that's a life you want. <laughs> right? it's, there's a miscommunication in there, right? There's, there's an issue. So. At the same time, right, we've got technology, and of course it's, it's a buzzword I couldn't talk about. I couldn't give an educational presentation without mentioning technology at some point. But again, it's easy to forget the fact that today we are the most educated we have ever been as, as humans, right? And I don't just mean Americans, I mean every human ever. Um, you know, uh, for example, it's a very common practice in journalism to write your newspaper articles at like a fifth grade level, which sounds kind of bad, right? But at the same time, imagine they're writing, that means that the average education that they're assuming for their readers is at least a fifth grade level. It wasn't before, right? At one time it was a, a first grade or a kindergarten education level. It's not saying it's good, but what I'm saying is at least we're a fifth grade level. In turn, we also have the idea of, of basic literacy, 
right? We're not playing to the students' strengths, right? Kids today, absolutely, hands down, today, read more than they ever have in all of human history, period. The catch is they're not reading necessarily what we want them to be reading, right? They're not casually sitting down with War and Peace and just kind of digesting it a bite at the time. Instead, they're reading Hunger Games or what, you know, who Betsy is dating, right? This is what they're concerned with. At the same time, you could say, well, Chris, it's not necessarily what they're reading, but it's how they're reading, right? Their literacy is breaking down. They're using these shortened individual letter forms. They don't even know how to, how to type properly anymore. God forbid we teach typing, right? But here's the problem. Think about, think about like text speak and how deplorable it is, right? God forbid, we, we can't even spell out a word. We don't even have so much time, except for the fact that when you think about it historically, shorthand was around a lot longer and did a lot more. People encourage people or students to learn shorthand for a long time based completely off of phonetics and getting an idea and a message across quicker. I'm just doing it again. Nothing's changed. We're just doing it in a different way. Only this time, whereas before students were coerced into learning it, they're doing it on their own, right? So again, it's a matter of kind of not necessarily lowering your expectations, it's a matter of changing your expectations. They're reading more, so please God, keep reading more. At the same time, we need to con uh, concern ourselves as art teachers with the idea of creativity. Okay, you've read who Betsy is dating, but now build that into a story, whether it's creative writing, whether it's artistic nature, build this out into something. And of course, nothing has changed, right? We've always been antisocial, sitting on buses, staring hopelessly into words of text, always just a lot smaller now. All right, so another smart lady I would like to talk to here. Um, Carol Greck, uh, she did a number of different uh, uh, writings and different analytical uh, 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 ideas uh, that she's come along with where she talks about the idea of praise. Now this kind of links back over into the idea of, again, being against that gold star. There's nothing wrong with praising your students, and this has really historically kind of been an oncoming uh, idea for quite a while. It's not anything new. Um, but at the same time, too, and she brings up more statistical uh, analysis, but the idea of how we praise is extremely important, right? It's not that a gold star is a bad thing, especially at an elementary school level. It works phenomenally because they want that sticker. The problem is eventually that desire dies off. Right? Whether you're in third grade or sixth grade, eventually they don't want the dang sticker anymore. And the problem is if that's your only go-to source of reward, you're done. Right? Now all of a sudden they don't care about education anymore, kaput. But at the same time, what I can start to do is begin to go from that external idea into an internal idea. Right? How do I make them want to do the work right? themselves? Right? Because you all know yourselves, if I tell you right now, hey, whenever you get home, I know that you know it's gonna be like three or four o'clock whenever you get home, it's gonna be five o'clock when I get home. If I told you you have to go and clean out your garage, you'd be like, son of a gun, I don't wanna clean that damn garage. <laughs> but if you right now are thinking, I hope this presentation is over soon, I gotta get home and clean that garage. If you're thinking it, even though it might still be a chore, you're almost in a, like a sick way kind of looking into it. You're looking forward to the idea like, oh, I, mean, I gotta get home and get to that because you want to do it, right? It's intrinsically motivated as opposed to extrinsically. I can say, I'm gonna pay you 10 bucks if you clean that garage. Yeah, well, that's not worth $10 of my time. I can pay you $100. Well, I mean, I go, I'll go do it quicker. I'm not gonna want to do it, right? So what she gets into is the idea of praise, of reward. So if you're praising a student's intelligence, and these are, these are her words here, if you're praising a student's intelligence, the problem is that at the end of the day, they're, you're building a sensation of fear. Because you're saying, oh, oh, how, how smart you are. You figured that out all on your own. Yay, right, good for you. The problem is you're patting them on the head and they know they're at 100% uh, right now. They have motivationally built themselves up. You are perfect. The problem with that 100% is they can only go down from here. So whenever I say, hey guys, you wanna try something new? They're gonna say, hell no, I'm already perfect. You give me something new, I could fail. I don't want it to fail, right? Instead, we rotate that around and we start praising their desire, right? We start praising how they actually work. So instead, you could say something like, you worked very hard on that, right? We're praising their diligence on an effort. Would you like a new challenge, right? Oh, okay, well, yeah, I, you know, I worked hard on that one. Give me something else to work hard on. We're praising the effort, not the result. Right? All right. So, 
couple other peeps to talk about here. So we've got Dr. Joseph here. And Dr. Joseph, again, building kind of on these same concepts. Um, talks about the idea that the human brain loves novel and new ideas, novel and new uh, thoughts. And again, these are not really all that novel. We know it ourselves. I could show you, uh, well, Star Wars is a horrible example, but I could show you a lot of different movies. Star Wars, because I could watch it any time of any moment of any day. But I could show you any movie. Just pick one off the top of your head. And but even if it is Star Wars, even if it's your favorite movie ever, by the time you've watched it, I don't know, ten times in a row, you kind of don't give two craps about Luke Skywalker anymore. We get it. He gets the lightsaber, cuts some people, and then we're good, right? It gets boring, right? Because we know what's going to happen. Now, what ends up happening is, and as you guys know, whether it's in the arts or in any form of education, particularly in math, where it's more uh, analytically minded, is we get into the idea of repetition equals memorization, right? I'm gonna keep beating it into your head and you're gonna memorize it. And or, as we all have done, because at some point you guys went through college and you totally did this, you just cram before the test, you take the test, and then they come sparting out your brain. You don't retain anything, right? That's a huge problem, and yet the problem is not with education, the problem is with us. I'm gonna find the shortest route to this solution, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's how can we utilize that shortcut kind of ingrained mentality. So instead, again, I'm going to reward the persistence, right? The action of not saying no, and the action of kind of gaining that understanding. I oftentimes will talk to my students about the idea, that, or the differences, excuse me, between wisdom and intellect. Every student that I have, at some level, wants to be considered uh, smart. No one wants to be dumb. And some of them have accepted, that, again, that role, but deep down, no, I mean, no one wants to be dumb, right? But the problem is they think that the answer to not being dumb, they think the opposite of dumb is, is intelligence. Intelligence is memorization. You've read a lot of books, whoop-de-doo, right? Wisdom is what do you do with that knowledge. It's the hands-on, street-smart skill. Um, there's a, a movie, I, my background's in film studies, sorry. So there's a movie, uh, and there's a quote from the movie that I really enjoyed, where a, uh, a car pulls up to a, a gas station. A fellow's talking to a young boy and he says, uh, do you know the difference between wisdom and intelligence? The kid says, yeah, sure, sure. He goes, all right. He goes, uh, do you know how to clean uh, a windshield? He says, yeah, I know how to clean a windshield. He says, great, you're intelligent. Whoop do you for you. You are an intelligent person. You know how to clean a windshield. He tosses him a squeegee and says, clean the damn windshield. He says, now you're wise. Now you're using that knowledge to actually do something, to project, or project yourself forward instead of just sitting on your hind horses and doing nothing. So, if we keep perpetuating the idea, or at least this, this concept, of rewarding the wrong thing, giving the gold star for doing the right thing, patting them on the head, moving them along, eventually we start getting into self-doubt, right? We all self-talk, we all have a, a conscious that's speaking to us. Mine's doing it right now, my heart's gone by this. Mm -hmm. um, but, at the end of the day, every single person that you are dealing with is really, and I don't mean this in a but we're egocentric creatures. We're thinking about ourselves, right? It's very easy, and I apologize, this just works really well for the demonstration. <clears throat> Whenever you enter a room, because I'm going to assume naturally that not everyone here knows each other. I, again, I'm not from this group, but I'm assuming you haven't like had a powwow ahead of time without me. Okay, so you walk into the room. Right? And as you enter the room, what's going through your head is, oh my god, where do I sit? I don't know any of these people. I don't, oh, I hope there's an empty seat. Oh, it's in the front. I know it's in the front. Dear God, I can't sit in the front. Right? You're thinking about yourself the whole time. Right? I'm not walking in and saying, oh, I hope you're doing okay. Is your day going well? No, no, no. I'm thinking, holy hell, I gotta be the cool kid. But the cool kid doesn't sit in the front. I sit in the back. That's where I sit. Right? So we're going through and thinking about ourselves. The catch is, so is everybody else. They're not thinking about you. They're not even noticing you enter the room because they're wondering, oh man, I chipped that one nail, son of a bitch, <laughs> right? They're in here, we're all in here. Hello. Hi. She's thinking about herself right now. I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, all right, all right. Big wall of text, never good to have a big wall of text in a PowerPoint presentation. All right, so here again, we're, we've hit kind of the, the valley, right? Things have gone wrong in education. We know this, we know this, but again, there are ways out, right? It's kind of like admitting the problem, right? So 2002, we have No Child Left Behind, your personal opinions aside, um, that did obviously bring up the idea that every student, every school had to have 100% proficiency. So again, humans, right? Not the fault of education, the fault of the fact that we exist. We found ways of cutting corners. So between 2005 and 2007, they just lowered their expectations of what proficient was. Oh, sure, we'll get 100%, but 100% is like, you know, it used to be like 40%. That's good enough. 
Um, the GED just recently, literally January of this year here, just lowered their minimum requirements from uh, 150 to 145. Again, it's only five points, but it's five points. So here's the question you have to ask. Instead of saying, oh, well, it's only five points, who's it benefiting? I mean, really, who missed that one gray or that one question? They said, oh, thank God, it was 145. If you're going to lower it, just take it down to zero. Why the hell not, right? Why lower it a minuscule amount? It's so it looks good on paper. So you can get an extra 3% on their printouts and they can start looking good. It doesn't make any sense from the people's point of view. It makes sense from their point of view. Um, again, the idea of, of cheating starts to rise. Cheating has always been a problem. That's nothing new. Again, we're humans. If you're writing really large and you just happen to be in my, you know, side view uh, mirror right there, I can just, <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier than studying. Um, but the problem is the pressure isn't necessarily rising for cheating, the pressure is rising for getting it right, right? And where does that come from, right? The pressure of getting it right doesn't come from the arts, right? Because we constantly, hopefully, uh, talk about the ideas of, of you know, art is subjective, right? How do you feel about it? All my students constantly ask me, oh, Mr. Kozak, uh, did I do this right? I literally had a student once, we were doing a cardboard sculpture project and the, the student was making an eagle. And he said, uh, does this look like an eagle? I said, oh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of cubist. What do you think? Does it look like an eagle? And the student's like, yeah, yeah, I think it looks like an eagle. I said, why the hell did you ask me then? If you know it feels like an eagle. So I'm trying to build up that internal desire, right? He already knows that it sounds, or that it, excuse me, that it looks like an eagle. But then immediately, the second I turn my back, he says, hold oh, on, I come back. He says, yeah, but well, what color should I paint it? I said, what color is an eagle? He said, I don't know. I said, then you should look up some reference. Find the type of eagle you want. I said, you want to paint a purple eagle? Paint a damn purple eagle, buddy, but you have to be the one who cares about it more than me. Because how many of us have returned an art project to a student and it immediately goes into the trash because they don't care about it. They didn't care about it in the first place. And if they don't care about the art, they sure as hell don't care about the grade. And if they don't care about the grade, then all of a sudden we're down the spiral and they don't care about the class. Because inevitably what happens, you have a teacher that calls you up, or excuse me, a parent that calls you up, and they say, how's my kid failing art? It's just art. And nothing makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up more than the word just, right? Why isn't it just math? Why isn't it just English? Well, because the parents are also playing their role. A good parent gets their kid into a good school, and a good school requires good math scores. I worked for a college. We don't care. They look at your GPA, and they say, good enough, and they move you along. I've told students this exact same thing. They don't believe me. I literally have worked for a college. There's not a college in the world other than maybe like Yale. I totally didn't work for Yale. Um, there's not a college in the world that's going to say, well, you got a D minus in art in uh, fourth grade. I'm so sorry. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen, right? At the same time, too, again, we do need to objectify our artwork slightly because we have to give it a grade. Right? We have to quantify that grade. I try my best to kind of take it out of my hands in my classroom. I, I use rubrics for every single project that I have. And it's worked out really well so far so that when a teacher comes knocking on my door or a parent comes knocking on my door, excuse me, um, all of my students have to upload their artwork online, every single one of them. Online, um, whether you're using Blackboard, Canvas, I, I personally use DeviantArt. It's a website I've used many, many times before. Kind of like a Facebook for artists. Um, they have to upload all their stuff online. What was that? Uh, DeviantArt. Even art. Uh, it's, it's a good website. Some of your students might already use it before. Um, I just made a group. I actually got in contact with the uh, the company themselves and said, hey, I want to make a group for my students. Um, and so that way, instead of me kind of clicking and hunting down their web page to see if they turned in their project online, um, they have to submit it to the group. So I just load up the group, and there's a big wall of their artwork. If they didn't submit it by the deadline, too bad, so sad, they get a zero. That's the point of a deadline, right? I won't lie. My students know ahead of time, I am a horrible jerk about deadlines. In turn, and I tell them this ahead of time, I'm also not the helicopter teacher. I'm not gonna come, I mean, I'll come around and check up on them, but I'm never gonna come around and be like, hey, you're, uh, you're not working right now. Why aren't you working right now? You should, you should work right now. Go ahead and work right now. Because guess what, it's art, and it is subjective. There are times where like, you know what, I just kind of not feeling it right now. So instead I'm gonna say, hey, you know what, we're gonna do this still life project, the still life set up, we're gonna draw it. I can't have you disturb anybody else. But at the same time, if you need to check your cell phone, well, I've got my cell phone too. Actually, mine's in the back recording. Hello. Um, but, yeah, this will be on YouTube. Yay! Um, but that being said, right, at no point in time, I have to hold them to my own standards. If I'm not gonna hide my cell phone in my car, maybe your schools have different rules, but I'm totally not giving up my cell phone. I'm not gonna expect them to either. At the same time, I'm also not mid-lecture gonna take a cell phone call. I'm not gonna check my tweets, right? So there's a certain level of kind of quid pro quo, right? I'm gonna expect what I do out of them. 
So I'm never gonna hover over them. I'm never gonna say, you have to work on your homework. At the same time, there's a deadline. So you know what? You wanna coast all day? whoop de do for you, man. Friday is that deadline. And if you turn nothing in, you're going to get the fruits of your labor. And if parents come calling, they come getting angry, let them get angry. They knew what was going on, right? I have to draw a hard line because guess what? That's why the parents respect the English and the math teacher. Because when a parent says, why is Billy failing? The teacher just pulls out the test and says, look, he failed the test. And they go, oh, well, he did. There's an F. I see that right there. He must have failed. <laughs> right? That's the end of it, right? They never question it. They might get angry. Well, how can, how can we get him tutoring? We need him tutoring, right? That's fine, right? But there's a hard line. The problem with art is that it is subjective. Well, how did he get a D on, on you know, drawing the human portrait? Well, you and I all know, I can look at this and be like, dude, it's totally a D. It looks like crap, right? I mean, I know that, right? But at the same time, if I can quantify it using a rubric, that becomes my first line of defense, right? That becomes my first line where I say, look, here's the grade. Well, they might question you a little bit further. Okay, well, look, he had a whole week to do this and he didn't work on this project. Oh, okay, well, and they still might attack you some more, right? Because they're hot and bothered and all that jazz. But again, at least you have a couple lines of defense blocking you along your way. Shifting over. See, it's an element now again. Right. So, schools. We know that there's problems. At the same time, we've gotten into a huge issue where we have the criminal element. Now, again, I don't know about your particular schools. My school is teeny tiny and very rural. Um, I will tell you an honest truth. Uh, this is a factual story, and I will forewarn you, I'm totally going to swear. Okay, brace yourself. Are you ready? Oh, 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 swearing. Okay, are you ready? This absolutely happened. In my first year teaching, to give you an idea of what kind of school I'm coming from, I had a student who was very, very upset. And this student totally just zoned out, had been zoned out for two weeks in a row, just turned in nothing. And I come around, I'm like, look, buddy, we gotta, you gotta do something. You gotta work with me here. Right, he's upset. So I start kind of walking, so I'm gonna come back, do what you need to do. So he slowly starts packing up his stuff, very quietly, didn't, didn't want to disrupt the class. Very quietly starts packing up his stuff, zips his bag, quietly puts his backpack on, pushes in his chair. Again, mama raised him, right? <clears throat> and he goes to leave the room. And as he leaves, to make a profound statement, he turns around, brace your ears now, he turns around and goes, you, sir, and he leaves the room. <laughs> Not lying, that absolutely happened to me. I couldn't take him seriously. I was just like, okay, buddy, like, you know. You go for it. I ended up meeting him in the hallway, and I just told him flat out, I said, look, man, I said, I'm not going to yell at you, I'm not going to get you in trouble, I'm totally not going to send you to the office, because all they're going to do is have you sit down. That's what you want to do. That's the opposite of what I want to have you to do. I said, literally, all I want you to do, I said, give me your backpack, let's leave it here, so at least you have to return at some point. I said, walk to school. Take the hall pass, wander. Just go. Just go. Right? Now, again, he could have totally left the school, right? And I would have been in dee doo doo right? But he had a hall pot, a hall pass, so I figured that covered me a little bit. So he starts, he wanders to school, came back five, 10 minutes later, totally cool as a cucumber, took his backpack, sat down and literally professedly, or just, just constantly, hit, I'm really sorry, I've just, I've been having a lot of things going, and like totally just broke down, 100%. Now again, that is an odd, but it gives, gives you kind of an idea. My school is not like, you know, crime USA. It's just not. At the same time, the school that I went to when I was in high school, was. I grew up in inner city Pittsburgh. It was not, you know, the, the corn to kid ratio was significantly different than where I am currently. But here's the problem. More recently, in the five years that I've been at my current school right now, down in North Carolina, in the five years I've been there, the criminal element has been on the rise. Two, count them, two girls have gotten pregnant. Dear God, no! <laughs> uh, right? Uh, one, one kid had the police called on him. No, a fight, oh, right? Rural North Carolina never saw it so bad, right? Of course, of course, the criminal element is on the rise, but here's the problem, what, this, what the administration is not seeing is that it becomes a cyclical nature. And we all know this because we see it every day, right? The kids walk around, they have a bell to go to, just like a warden telling them where to go to. They're guided, they're told, you have to go here, they're not choosing it. If a kid doesn't necessarily like a class, they're shoved into a class because they have to put you somewhere just like prison. Uh, a student walking around aimlessly, God forbid, you have to be in a classroom. You cannot, you took more than three seconds at water fountain, get somewhere, right? We <laughs> yell at them, right? We slap them on the wrist. We tell them they're doing wrong constantly, right? Constantly. They walk through hallways that are barren of art. They're just concrete slabs. I, I tried to put up a mural into the ceiling and literally it was taken down 
because God forbid that that might catch on fire and cause an extra amount of smoke. I then, I know, right? I then, because I was so frustrated, said, no, 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 schools do this. This is not an abnormal thing. They said, no, 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 not in our school. So I pulled up the North Carolina Fire Code and Safety uh, Standards, which let me tell you, is a breeze to read. Um, read through that real quick, highlighted everything I possibly could, brought it down to the school board, and demanded that they themselves, not me, because I already had put it up in the first place, demanded that they put it back up as a sign of defiance. And they did because they had literally no red tape to block. The catch being, and as the moral for my, my students, I had to do the legwork. I didn't just roll over and die. And I couldn't also go down and just cause a ruckus and kick a chair over, right? I had to go and do research and, and hunt down the facts. But when I had the facts, like a good lawyer, screw them. What do they got on me? I've already won. The problem is with this criminal element that we're constantly scared of is that we're feeding it. Right? It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I've invented the idea of medieval economics. What do we do? We launch money at it, at the problem, but the problem is the problem gets bigger. So then, well, we launch some more money at it, but we're feeding, literally financially, feeding the problem. Let's hire another police officer. You think the kids don't notice that there's cops in their school? That feels like a prison, right? So what do they do? They respond like prisoners, right? right? The catch is this, we in the arts, we are the solution. Kids don't want to go to math already. And don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong, math could really stand for a dose of creativity themselves. For the most part, for the most part, kids want to be in our class, right? And you know, especially with your, like, your advanced kids, especially the art three or whatever grade you have, eighth grade, whatever you're at, those kids desperately, like your class is the only thing that gets them through the day, right? So we already have the in with these kids. We already can start to prove to them that there's something better than this weird bubble that they've been raised inside of, right? We can show them different cultures across history, across the world, right? Because we are already, by the simple fact that we're the arts, we are cross-curricular, right? And cross-curricular is extremely important, and of course it's a buzzword, but think about the fact that history, right? I use this one a lot, and angers all, all the history teachers. Everything in a history textbook is art. It's in my classroom. I just gave it to them. I loaned it to them, right? Whenever they start talking about ancient Egypt, what are you talking about? Ancient Egypt's art. Whenever you talk about ancient Greece, what are you talking about with ancient Greek art? Because that's the only thing. Culture is the only thing that's left behind from these cultures, right? It's the only thing. Talk about ancient, uh, you know, not even ancient. Talk about the American Revolution. What do you show? You show, you know, rifles, pistols, and talk about the wars. Well, those were man-made, handcrafted tools made by artisans and designers. It's all our stuff. We are cross-curricular because the arts is everything, right? We are a little bit of everything, right? So it's not that we're forced to be cross-curricular. We are cross-curricular, right? So we are the solution to this problem because we don't even necessarily, as we all know, right? We don't need money. I can teach art by going outside and drawing a circle in the dirt with a stick, right? Granted, there are more advantageous ways of doing it, but I don't need anything because it's already here and it's already here in our students as well, right? They want to express themselves, whether it's through musical arts or performing arts or visual arts, they have so much to say and their only outlet is Twitter, right? We fill that void, but we also have to be able to step over the wall that is the academia side of things, right? It doesn't have to be so by the book. We don't have to make 4,000 photocopies and hand out tests because it's been done in the past or done to us. We know what works. Just trust your gut and go with it, right? All right, so this is, I just like this little quote here. Um, and you guys probably have heard this before. It's an old one, but I still like it. So to summarize, because I really don't like walls of text. To summarize, right? Imagine for a second that you have, you're at the beach. I live by the beach, so I have a beach. Okay. And you go ahead and you scoop up a handful of sand, right? Along comes a wind because, well, there's wind that's going to happen. You can't stop the wind, right? So along comes a wind, and some of the little grains start to go two, three, four little grains locked up in the wind. You get scared. I mean, you have a whole mountain of sand, but you lost two or three. You're scared. So what do you do? You snap your hand closed. But when you do so, all that sand runs through your fingers. You've just squeezed out anything that possibly wasn't going to be bothered by the wind at all out of fear, right? And now what do you have? Well, you might have a little small pile of sand, but all the good stuff is gone because you squeezed it out with that tight fist. What we should aim for as teachers is not a flat palm because we're going to lose some kids to the wind, but also is not the knee-jerk reaction of clamping our hand down to retain the handful of kids that we have because we're going to lose anyone that we had any potential with. You want to aim for that nice cup, right? I'm gonna, I have some rules, but they're not harsh rules. 
right? I don't have, in my classroom, I don't have a wall of rules, right? I don't know about you, whenever I went back to school to get my teaching certificate, they told me flat out the number one thing, actually two things, the, the two things that every teacher should always do, have a huge rule list so that every kid knows what's expected of them, and never, under any circumstances, ever talk bad about a kid, never demean a kid. I work with high school kids. If you pick on a kid, it works wonderfully. I'm not saying it's nice, but man, do they respond really, really well because they're really concerned about their social pressures. I teach art in the middle of nowhere. I don't really care about myself, it's fine, right? I've got nothing to live towards as far as my own reputation because my reputation is separate than my role. The art that I make goes into galleries in Norfolk or other cities. That's me. Then I go and teach as well. That's a separate entity, right? I don't have a list of rules because I only have one rule. Long ago, my first year teaching, I had five or six rules because I was going to be the good teacher that made all these good rules. But the problem is every kid that goes to every different classroom, they're going to run into problems because every classroom has different rules. And then the school has different rules. In some classes, you can listen to music and some you can't, right? And they run into these problems. So I have one single rule and it works really, really, really well for the art classroom. It sounds a little dumb, but I promise you it'll work. My only rule for the art classroom is don't be handsy. That's it. Don't be handsy, right? Don't be handsy. Here's the thing. It summarizes a lot. I don't want you touching other people. That makes me vomit. It's gross and sick and I don't want any smooching going on. At the same time, don't touch other people's arts. There, or, there's nothing you can do that can positively influence their art. It's theirs. Leave it alone. At the same time, I've got exacto blades in my classroom. You will lose a finger if you're handsy. It's not good, right? So just keep your hands to yourself and guess what? All of a sudden, everything else will iron itself out. I've got one single hall pass in my classroom to organize my class. I tell my students on the first day of class, I don't need to know about your bladder. You know more about your bladder than I ever need to know about. When I need to go to the class or to the bathroom, I don't ask your permission. At the same time, I don't need their permission. I don't need them to sign out and say, exactly. well, I left at 12, 13. If you need to take a pit stop and go get a drink, you're a human, go get a drink. This is not a prison, I don't need to lock you down. In turn, I do need to keep tabs on you. So. I've got one hall pass, and they have to take that hall pass. That way, only one person can be out at a singular time. So if the office calls and says, where's Betsy Johnson? I look around, I don't see Betsy Johnson. The hall pass is missing. I go, well, she's having tinkle time right now. When she gets back, I'll send her down to you. Because there's only one hall pass. It makes things really easy, right? That way, they have the freedom to come and go as they please, right? At the same time, they have social pressure, because they're high schoolers and they're scared of social pressure, that while they're wandering aimlessly and they're you know, checking up on their friends, things they shouldn't do, they also know that they're holding this hall pass, stopping someone else from going to the bathroom, right? So eventually that social pressure kicks in. Don't get me wrong, that first week or two, people are wandering the hallways and that is nerve wracking on me. But eventually the social pressure of them just being high schoolers kicks in, crunches on down, and they come back on their own. I don't have to hunt them down because they know, oh, well, Tom really did have to go to the bathroom, so I'll give him the hall pass. It's really easy. The final kicker to all this, my hall pass is a chair, so. Yes! Oh no, it's totally a chair, literally. I just took a chair and I spray painted it, and it says uh, Mr. Kozak's hall pass. So, there, if you're just going out to wander aimlessly, if you're just gonna, you know, wander around, uh, no one wants to lug this around, right? And yet, if you have a full bladder, you are more than happy to lug this around, right? I just, get out of the way, I gotta go to the bathroom right now, right? They see you coming from a mile away. Oh, you're, you're Kozak's kid. You've got the chair. I, I get it, right? It's easy. It's easy. Okay. All right. So, kind of winding down around. So, here's the problem. A lot of school teachers, and I'm not saying you guys, because yeah, we're the arts. We are inherently better just by being creative. But here's the problem. A lot of school teachers still live by Machiavellian rules, right? It is better to be loved or feared. Those are your only two options. Because anything in the middle is hard. It's easier. I can scare the hell out of you, or I can, you know, love you and pat you on the head. Great, you may not give me good work, but you'll feel good about yourself. And you might give me really good work, but you'll hate me at the end of the day. Being somewhere right in the middle is really hard. But here's the problem. What do you want your kids to do? When you present them with something difficult, you want them to persevere through it. We have to take a bite of our own medicine. We too have to persevere through the difficulties, right? Fight through the bad and the good. Find that middle form. What I found that works well for me personally, and again, it may not work for you, but I found that works well for me personally is kind of the actions speak louder than words. My actions are, I will always be there for my students. They call me, I will literally sprint over to help them out. In turn, when they call me over and say, how do you like this? I'm gonna say, well, now how do you feel about it? 
Well, I, I don't really like it over here. Okay, well, I'm gonna tell you the truth here. This part over here really sucks. Mm -hmm. Flat out, it is not good. But over here, you're kind of working with something pretty good. It's all right. Why don't we go ahead and kind of work this over in here. We'll add a little bit of shading. We can clean it up. I'm gonna be honest with them because the problem is this. When they catch on that you're lying to them, you know, patting them on the head and whatnot. When they catch on, that means that every, everything you've ever told them potentially could be a lie. They don't trust you anymore. You've broken that. And they no longer like you. So the good is gone. They also no longer want to work for you. So the bad is gone. You've lost everything because you were trying to be a good person. Screw it. I already have friends. I don't need them as friends, right? <laughs> I'm here to make them into good artists, period, right? All right, so we're gonna talk about bacon. Hold on. Bacon, hold on. <laughs> bacon, hold on, hold on. Bacon, okay, I'm gonna talk about Francis Bacon, the philosopher, okay? And Francis Bacon, the see, listen, it's a visual joke for artists. Okay, so Francis Bacon, the philosopher, had a really cool idea. And yeah, maybe you write about his stuff, maybe you haven't, but I really like his directionality. I won't lie, I'm not 100% su subscribed to him, but we'll kind of start here for a second. He talked about how there are three types of people in the universe, right? There are ants. Ants go out, they're extroverts, right? They have nothing of their own, but they go out and they find things, and they bring it back home, and they build stuff out of it, right? I'm gonna go out and find people that can do some work for me. Oh, you got a cool idea, come on, let's bring it back. They're really out there. The problem is they have nothing of their own to offer. There are spiders. Look, that's creepy. Ooh. All right, there are spiders. Spiders, singular, solitary, introverts. They only use what they have on themselves. Their webs are made out of things from inside. Introverts only think within. It's good, but you know, anyone comes over to visit and you, you know, eat them, so that's not good. What we should be aiming for in his theory we should all try to aim to be bumblebees, right? Or, or wasps, if you want to be tougher. We should all try to aim to be bumblebees. Oh, bees go out, they find stuff, they digest that stuff, and then with their kind of excretions, right? It's, it, honey is, is vomit. Um, with their excretions, they make something new from the external source. So they go out, the best of kind of the extroverts, they think and contemplate the best of the introverts, and then they create. That's where we, the artists, come in, right? Now, I won't lie to you, I think his idea is great. It also harkens back a little bit to this kind of stuff. How many of you guys have taken the Myers-Briggs test, right? Okay, how many of you guys like the Myers-Briggs test? Eh, right, it's kind of a resounding eh, right? It's something fun, but it's not amazing, right? And here's the problem, here's the big problem with Myers-Briggs, is that it puts us in a box. And again, we're already artists, we already don't like being in boxes. But other people really do. I've had students that come back and say, like, this is life changing. Oh my god, I found out that I'm an introverted uh, extrovert who on Saturdays likes to paint my toes. What do you do, man? This, the problem with this test is that it's like anything else that puts you into a box. Well, okay, yeah, well, personally, my birthday, uh, I am a Leo. I'm an extrovert, right? Personally, I'm a Leo, but the problem is some days I act more like a cancer, you know what, occasionally I have a really bad day, maybe I'm feeling a little boisterous, so I'm more like a Taurus. The problem is my birthday doesn't tell me who I am. My actions tell me who I am. My actions and things that I've done over my lifetime have built up who I am. I'm not a box. But how many times do you have a student that wants to be a box? I use, I use astrology all the time with my kids because they want to. I'm like, when's your birthday? That's why we right? get along. Exactly, right. exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And the key is, they love it. But here's the thing, there's a reason why they love it, right? There's a reason why they love it. Oh, I don't. Okay, so there's a reason why they love it, right? Okay, so we've got an internal and external locus of control. If you're an inter or external locus of control, the idea is very simple. Everything outside of you guides your life. You, you believe in fate, you believe in luck, you believe in, in divine intervention, and you <laughs> love gold stars, right? right? At the same time, you could have an internal locus of control. Literally everything in your life is your fault, right? It sounds really negative until you look at the twist side of things. If everything is my fault, that means that everything positive is also my fault. It's not a bad thing to do, right? That means that if someone knocks over that trash can, right, it's my fault that I didn't pick it up, right? It gives you control over your own lifetime. Now, I won't lie, being 100% of an internal locus of control type personality, it can lead to really some devastating problems because eventually you'll start kind of eating into your own self, right? Oh, I, sh I can't believe I didn't help that one person, right? You kind of get in your head a little bit too much. 
At the same time, understand that we have more control. Our students have more control than just things happening. We like getting put into a box because what ends up happening is we don't have to make that choice anymore, right? Um, high school, again, I'm talking from a high school standpoint. High schoolers all the time, if one girl has two boys that likes her, right, it's much easier to have them kind of inadvertently meet up and get into a fight. She doesn't have to make the choice. They'll just fight, she'll go with the winner, the end, right? And even if that person's not right for her, well, fate decided, right? This, he was the stronger, she was about, no, screw that crap. Go with the guy you like and screw the rest, right? Have some control, have some ownership in your life. You don't need the dang gold star. You're better than the gold star, right? All right, so in the classroom, right, we need to start shifting things around, right? We need to start giving that internal locus of control a little bit more to the students, right? I need people to trust them a little bit, even in something as simple as testing. So what if, and this is just kind of proposing an open-ended kind of concept, what if I let my students use the internet? Right? They're not allowed. Screw that. I'm going to let them use the internet, but at the same time, I'm going to give them questions that are insanely difficult, so they have to do research. I'm going to give them questions that are open-ended, so it's not just typing into Google and getting an answer. Instead of what you know, what date did Washington cross the Delaware? It's okay. Well, when Washington crossed the Delaware, what were other things that were on his mind at the time? I, I can't Google that question. There isn't an answer. I have to hunt these things down. Go ahead, use the internet. Wikipedia it up. Go to town. Right. I'm gonna let them use these topics, but I'm gonna change the question, right? Um, something I do all the time, and it works geniusly, and you might have done it yourself. If I have a student, or if I have a class, and I wanna give them like a 20 point quiz, I'll give them 30 question quiz, and tell them that they can take 10 questions off. They're elated, oh, I, can, I can mark off any 10 questions, totally. I only wanted them to answer 20, they're doing more work. It's great, it's easy. It makes them feel like they're having some control over their lives. At the same time, I'm getting the response I wanted anyway. And I can also dictate very easily by looking at their tests, oh, well, they all marked off number 15. That means I need to review number 15, right? It solves the problem for me. And I, at the same time, they don't feel bad about it, and they feel empowered. It's kind of a win, right? Let them work in groups, but let them work through different, um, different cognitive exercises. Right? Like I said, I let my students uh, upload everything online. That's more for me, I won't lie. Um, I don't like lugging home papers because inevitably the one kid who did a really good project, theirs is the one get, that gets destroyed and they actually cared about their project. They upload it online, I just take my laptop home, grade it home, it's really easy. <clears throat> we also do, I don't know how many of you guys do them, uh, again, different grade levels work differently. I do critiques for every single project, uh, some in person and some just simply online. They just have to go around, kind of find other students' projects and add comments online. It's, again, very, very easy. They're already used to it, so I'm just encouraging that behavior. Um, just some quick examples here. These are a handful, I mean, a small handful. I can give you a business card if you're interested and see a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, Every class that I have, I try to teach different uh, methodologies to, right? My art one class is 100% just about thinking creatively. I don't care how well they draw. I just want them to appreciate thinking creatively because if they go off and become a corporate CEO, they aren't gonna necessarily need to know how to draw a bottle well. At the same time, if they're able to think around corners, they're gonna get that promotion a lot quicker. It's the person who can find a quicker, easier way to redesign their environment. Maybe not necessarily artistically, but more aesthetically that they're gonna be able to find that anchor. I have a lot of my students, for example, this is one I just did last semester with my R2 class. The entire class of over 30 kids, um, we took two weeks, and they themselves developed from scratch, 100%, I offered literally nothing, I just simply wrote things on the front board so they could contain their ideas. Um, by voting process alone, um, developed, uh, wrote, designed, and illustrated their own children's books. Um, they came up with the story from scratch, uh, we just kind of followed that uh, the Fay, uh, was it the Faytag um, uh, arc, the climactic arc. We talked about Joseph Campbell's um, uh, journey of the hero, right? We talked about all that. I mean, the monument, everything, and they just followed that kind of template. You know, we designed characters. We voted on the designs. Every single character, or every single class uh, student in this one class, designed each character individually, and then we voted. I uh, just projected them on the back wall. Uh, we voted on which one they liked the best. They lent, uh, we made character sheets of those selected designs, and they had to learn how to draw each individual character. Then I taught them how to do watercolors, because we wanted to go for watercolor for the effect of the children's book. 
Then I went through and I got it printed, which sounds really expensive until you think about going to Walmart and just getting a photo book made. It's super easy and it costs like $4 a book. Um, I got six different copies printed up. There's now an issue of their book in every library in the general county. Um, and we also took a field trip for one class period and they read each book to each elementary school first and kindergartner class. It took two weeks. Two weeks. I teach a digital design class. Um, my final, after they've learned how to use Photoshop and illustration, they know how to do um, graphic design and logo design. I teach them how to do web design using coding. They take all that back around in their final five week long project, which is a really long time for one project, from scratch in a group, they make uh, their own video games from scratch. Now they're elated until they realize how incredibly difficult it is, but it works well. I've done it for five years in a row and I've got over 30 video games that are easily downloaded online that you yourself can play. Every single game is completely different. Some are successes, some are horrible failures. But my most proud uh, accomplishment of this project is not the video game design fact itself, the fact that they're making games. That's fun, but I could do anything, really. I could replace video games with anything. The fun part is it's the only project I've been successful in, and I try to change every project as often as I can. It's the only project, am I out of time? Okay. I don't know how am I doing? Two oh, yeah. minutes, man. Two minutes? Oh my god, I'm never gonna finish. Okay. <laughs> so, my most proud moment about this project in particular is the fact that it is as close to a business as it can be. The groups are made up, they choose their own groups from the beginning. They make their own team of four to five kids, okay? Each kid gets their own computer, we just hang out on the computer lab all day. Um, they can fire members of their team if they're not pulling their own weight because inevitably group projects suck because you always have the one kid who's dead weight. They can fire them. Um, that kid then says, well, what am I supposed to do? It's really easy. Um, the project is due in about five weeks. You have a video game to make. Um, should have done something. Good luck. Um, and then if more than one kid gets fired, they can join and make their own new team where they start pulling themselves out of the gutter, right? I have to let them fail a little bit in order to kind of find their own way. Um, but I'm basically the producer. I keep tabs on what they've accomplished day by day and I award them a certain amount of points as they go along. They have a team leader. I will only talk to their team leader. So if there's five members on a team and you're my team leader, they talk to you and you talk to me. I don't ever hear from them, ever, right? If they have an issue, I'll relay it through you. I'll email them. It is a business. For all intents and purposes, I could be in a different room and it would still run itself because that's how the real world works. I'll talk to you more a little bit. Uh, if you have any interest, in, like I said, I'll give you my email, but I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna fast forward. Things you can do, simple, in your classroom. Don't ever sit down. It's really hard to stand back up again, right? I just, just don't ever sit down. That way, if a kid calls me over, I'm already standing, I'm halfway there, you know what I mean? I'll sit down during planning period. Um, you guys were talking about music earlier today. I have a, I get this, I had a grant written. The government bought me a sound bar, it was great. I have a sound bar and I play music. I tell my students, you're allowed to bring headphones. If you don't like my music, you can listen to your own music. I don't wanna hear yours, however, so don't turn it up too loud. I play, a sound, or I play music, I will vary that. I basically use Pandora. Um, I vary that music. The kids think that like, oh, Mr. Kozak's in the mood for rap today. I go purely off of tempo of music. So if I need my kids to work faster, I play you know, electronic. <laughs> if I need them to slow down, oh, your deadline's going on, I need you to focus, I'll play classical studying. That is a really good state your channel. Um, I'll play classical for studying, and they slow down. It's all about the tempo, and that's scientifically proven. Uh, at the same time, too, the one thing that happened whenever I first came into this job that I was working at, and this was about my classroom, this is just one I found on Google, but my classroom was destroyed by the teacher before me. It was really kind of gross. Like, I'm surprised I didn't find dead things. I did find some rats, it was not good. They were not moving. Um, it was horrible, it was horrible. The problem is that very same teacher and other teachers like her had gone through and complained all the time that the kids, you know, drew on the tables and messed things up. Well, you don't give a damn about the classroom either. Why should they? My classroom is spotless to this day. I don't have a lot of things hanging on the wall. I hang up their artwork. They don't need inspiration. They have phones. If you need reference, look up your own reference. You don't need to see how Da Vinci is better than you, right? We already know it, right? <laughs> so I hang up your artwork so that you can be encouraged to get your name on that board, right? So if I keep my room as clutter-free as possible, I don't have to tell them to clean up. They clean up because that's how it was when they came in. Now, yes. Occasionally, I'll have two or three kids that totally just jet, and guess what? I'm cleaning two or three tables. Oh well. Better than all of them. Better than all of them, because they came in with it being clean. So if I keep up on it, then they keep up on it. So I'm going to uh, end with two final points. Again, I'm kind of rushing through here. 
One, no crap we need to raise the bar. That's not new. But here's the way I look at it. I'm gonna raise the bar as high as I possibly can get away with, right? And I'm already expecting that every kid is gonna miss that bar. I already know it, right? But if I hold my bar here and every kid can get here, and let's say I hold my bar up higher, right? Every kid's gonna miss. But by simply by holding it up higher, they're gonna go a lot higher than they would have gone otherwise, right? They're gonna push themselves already because the expectation is higher. My students are their expectations. So I'll skip over this real quick, I apologize. Da Vinci was smart, okay. Um, finally, this is my absolute positive personal motto. It's nothing new, it's just what I live by. At all points in time, I'd let my students touch the stove. If you're a good parent, you should never let your kid touch a stove. It's dangerous, they won't be burnt, right? Here's the problem. If I stop, the, if I tell my student, or I tell my kid, don't touch the stove, it's hot. Instantly, hold on! Instantly, my kid is gonna ask, or, or a student is gonna ask, well, what is hot to you? Your hot may not be my hot. Hot is just a word, it's a concept. Now, they might not be able to articulate that, but that's what they're thinking, right? Because I've told them, don't do it. So what do they do? They're tempted, oh my God, well, what is hot? And they, they're gonna touch it anyway. And then they're gonna get burned and cry and blame it on me, right? So instead, go ahead and touch it. I'm gonna be standing right by with a bag of ice ready for you. I'm gonna clean up the pieces. Make your mistake, go ahead. Because the only things I've ever learned and the only things I've ever gained in my life were my own personal mistakes. Anything that's been taught to me, I've forgotten about, totally. And I love my mom dearly, but she used to say, don't talk to strangers. I talk to strangers all the time. <laughs> I can't get a job if I don't talk to strangers, right? Instead, make your mistakes. Learn what strangers not to talk to, right? And at the end of the day, if you allow your students to touch that stove, to get burned, but you're there, because again, my words and my actions are two separate things. My personality and my roles are two separate things. If I let them touch the stove, but I'm there ready to pick up those pieces, they know without me having to say it that I actually care. So that when I say, hey, your art's not that great, they're going to respect what I'm trying to tell them because they know that I actually give a crap about it. Cool? All right, that was a little bit quick, sorry. Good, right? Thank you very much.